Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to NCBA Property Finance Webinar themed Taking the Bold Step in Real Estate Investment. It is indeed a great pleasure to be hosting our second property finance webinar today. And on behalf of NCBA Group Managing Director, Mr. John Gashora, and the entire NCBA leadership, I would like to, to appreciate you taking the time to log into this webinar this morning. My name is Philip Pomondi and I'm the Business Development Manager, Property Finance at NCBA Bank, and I will be your moderator for today. We have lined up a panel of industry experts who will unpack our theme for today and share the outlook of the Kenya property market, as well as unpacking investing in real estate in Kenya. I'm therefore delighted to extend a warm welcome to all our speakers and panelists for today who, en who will engage us in this discussion. Our panelists for today are in no particular order, Mr. Zorovar Singh, Director iJenga Ventures Limited. Mr. Singh, please say hi to our panelists. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to uh, be on the panel today, and uh, greetings to fellow panelists. Thanks for, to uh, NCBA for hosting today. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Secondly, we have Mr. George Washuri, CEO of Optivent Group. Good morning, everyone. It is uh, fantastic to be in this uh, particular forum. Uh, uh, thank you. All right. Thirdly, we have Mr. Kilundo Bithi, who is the founder and lead consultant, Investor Clinics. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to have a conversation on uh, the real estate subject, and I'm very grateful to NCBA for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kilundo. And we have Ms. Stella Mutai, who is our Head of Property Finance at NCBA Bank. Good morning, everybody. Glad to be here. And last but not least, our sign language interpreter, Ms. Anna Musiomi. Thank you, Anna. Please feel free to send in your questions, comments using the chat box for those on Zoom and Facebook and the comment section. Allow me to set the context for this discussion. We've witnessed a change in economic trends following the COVID-19 pandemic. This has had some effects on the property market. And as a bank that encourages and supports our customer to go for their goals, we have hosted this webinar to provide an outlook for the Kenyan property market, as well as unpacking invest, investing in real estate in Kenya. Even with the current COVID-19 led conditions, property still remains a lucrative investment uh, vehicle. Investing in property has always been positive for long-term growth and return. And surprisingly, the path to home ownership can be a tricky one. And at any given time, you'd always find yourself asking questions like, where do I start? What do I do? However, with the right advice, the journey is a rewarding one. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, Kenya's real estate se sector was poised for growth in 2020, having begun to show signs of recovery in 2019 from a, sl a sluggish growth experience in 2017 and 2018. With the onset of COVID pandemic, unprecedented disruption to the Kenyan economy has been witnessed over the past few months, with real estate sector experiencing shocks attributed to lockdown measures. While the sector is indeed facing hard times, it may be a good thing in this guys, for some buyers. At NCBA, we continue to support our customers, keep them informed, and help them to make the right financial decisions concerning pro the property market. Without much further ado, I would like to invite each and every one of you to this interesting and exciting webinar that we're going to hold today. At this point in time, allow me to request my host to play a very short video, after which we'll kickstart the webinar. With our NCBA Bank Home Loan, we can finance up to 105% of your mortgage and give you a repayment period of up to 25 years. Daddy, that is 25 birthdays for me in our own home. Many, many suppers together. Lots of laughter with mommy. We know that it's not about the house, but the many memories made in it. Get an NCBA Home Loan with up to 105% financing. The name is NCBA, and the numbers that matter to you matter to us. NCBA Bank. Go for it.
Thank you. Uh, it now gives me great pleasure to invite our group retail director, our group director, sorry, retail banking, Mr. Tyras Mudiga, to give us the opening remarks. Tyras Mudiga has over 30 years experience in retail banking. He has served in an array of leadership roles, locally, regionally, and internationally. Terras is a certified banker with professional training from London Institute of Banking and Finance and holds a chartered banker MBA from Bangor Business School, Bangor University in, in Wales, UK. Welcome, Mr. Mwedeka. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, a special thanks for your promotion. You called me the group managing director, which is quite fine with me. <laughs> uh, but um, distinguished guests, my fellow panelists, uh, with a special welcome and thank you for, for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, our valued customers listening to us, my colleagues at NCBA, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Um, as has been mentioned, my name is Tyrus Muithiga, I'm the group director responsible for retail banking at NCBA Group. Um, thank you for honoring our invitation. Um, and as Philip said, you, you, you real estate is an emotive, is an interesting, is a, some people say the biggest financial decisions most individuals make um, or, or the most significant or the first of the most significant as people develop financially. And so, so we're delighted to be hosting our second uh, webinar uh, on property finance uh, as part of a continuing series of thought leadership and, and support that we provide to our clients to educate and inform um, and invite you to this conversation. Um, we recently had the Money Mastery series um, and all of these recordings, including today's events, are always available on our social media platforms um, so that you can be able to catch up with them even if you miss a live event. Um, across groups, in families, chit chats, friends, works colleagues, charmers, I think property uh, is always a, a, a big topic um, uh, as we plan our financial futures. As has been mentioned last year, the real estate sector uh, uh, suffered uh, uh, some slowdown in growth, uh, obviously affected by the COVID and the impact of COVID uh, pandemic and the economic, uh, the lockdown and the consequential economic measures that followed um, uh, that impacted employees' welcome, uh, I mean, incomes um, and business cash flows uh, across many sectors in the economy. But as a famous saying by the US president, the 37th US president, Franklin Roosevelt, said, real estate cannot be uh, lost or stolen, nor can it be carried away. Uh, purchased, if purchased with common sense, paid for in full, and managed with reasonable care, it is uh, about the safest investment in the world. And so in the context of that, and the reality is that despite uh, temporary uh, impacts in, in, in the economy, um, uh, that truth still holds um, uh, across the years. Allow me to walk you through some quick highlights uh, of the sector and what is uh, uh, the main developments as we as we see them. First, the uptake of residential mortgages has begun to regain momentum in the last quarter of 2020, and we've seen that through the first quarter of 2021, uh, helped in part by the land transactions, uh, transfers and leases of the Ministry of Lands uh, that have uh, gradually risen and, and resumed as the registry is opened. And I think also as um, the government continues with these efforts to digitize the registries, allowing investors to finalize transactions, banks to be able to register charges. Um, and this resumption in property transactions, uh, although it has faced some challenges, um, uh, by, by, by large because of the impact I mentioned earlier that businesses were impacted, people's salaries were impacted, and so as, as we try to help our customers uh, structure their mortgages, we obviously have to be conscious of some of them uh, suffered reductions in income or dips in their cash flow. But we will be creative, we will be empathetic as we consider applications to make sure that uh, we, we support this with full understanding of the environment that uh, uh, caused that and, and focusing really on the fundamentals of the customer. Um, uh, uh, and their affordability of the mortgage. The government's efforts to centralize services and improve infrastructure in counties uh, through 
uh, Kura uh, uh, has contributed to an increase uh, in construction loans uh, with customers opting to build in, in a little further outlying areas that uh, hitherto are less accessible. So such areas as Kajiado, Kiambu, Machakos, uh, where land prices are slightly more affordable, are now opening up because it's getting easier to move around and, and access. And that, that is a huge enabling uh, uh, factor. Um, um, uh, that is initiated by the government. On the affordable housing sector, um, um, the KMRC, the affording, uh, the, the, the refinancing company, Kenya Mortgage uh, Refinance Company, uh, has been receiving additional funding uh, through the IFC, Shelter Afrique, which recently contributed 200 million uh, to KMRC. And we've also seen plans from KMRC uh, to raise five billion through the capital markets uh, and launch a green bond this year, uh, targeting institutional investors, um, uh, fund managers, and pension funds. The upshot of this is that uh, NCB, as a shareholder in KMRC, will tap into the funds that are available to ensure that affordable that mortgages we offer to afford in the affordable housing mortgage uh, space are actually affordable. Um, uh, and, and that we can um, facilitate uh, uh, the government objective uh, to increase the house ownership uh, with, with, with tangible evidence of affordable mortgages as well. On the SME front, uh, as I finish, um, you, you, you're familiar, obviously, that again, because of the COVID impact, um, uh, rental incomes were, were, were affected, people's abilities to pay rent uh, uh, was impacted. And so some real estate operators uh, in that space suffered some uh, recessionary impact. And although demand for housing itself did not finish, it did not diminish, obviously people need to live somewhere. Um, the reduction of disposable incomes meant there was downward pressure on rents uh, with the residents either choosing to negotiate with their landlords or relocate to more affordable uh, locations. As a result of that, the impact in that sector uh, was different. Um, on the upper prime end residential space, we saw some contractions of up to 10%, while the lower cadre properties um, uh, stagnated in both value and, and rental yield, and some even appreciated because you know, they hit the sweet spot between um, 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 uh, the affordability and availability. Prime commercial office rents uh, sector decreased by about 14% in the second half of 2020 due to decreased demand and especially the significant shift uh, of working from home and perhaps uh, in the space of grade A and B office space, which saw as much as a 40%, more than 40% uh, contraction, uh, it remains to be seen how much of that sector will, will recover, especially as corporates begin to shift in the ways that they work uh, to a more agile working from home uh, and realizing that perhaps in for some job roles um, uh, productivity and team working can still be sustained uh, despite people not necessarily congregating in the prime office space um, um, the hospitality sector probably uh, suffered the worst and continues to suffer and i think the outlook for that sector even from our economic desk still remains quite depressed in the short and probably even medium term um, due to the, um, uh, the continuing global impact of COVID, uh, restriction in travel, um, uh, still relatively slow progress of um, um, uh, uh, vaccination programs, uh, particularly in the third world, uh, despite the much, much more progress that has been made in the first world countries, which generally mean that business travel, uh, uh, um, conferences and, 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 and tourism will still remain uh, probably uh, impacted in the in the short in the medium um, short to medium term. Uh, so that's probably until after 2023. The overall impact of the pandemic and and how much of a recovery the re the entire real estate sector, uh, I think, is a topic I'd like to examine with the panel today. Um, I think it's 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 one where uh, many opinions will will be. Uh, many green shoots are coming and. And we, we, we are all optimistic that um, it, it, remain, it will remain resilient. What has helped a lot is, that, is the support that banks um, has, uh, provided to the sector, 
within the sector in Kenya, nearly 360 billion uh, shillings in loans uh, were restructured and uh, designed to protect customers against um, uh, the adverse impact of their inability to service uh, their covenants. And real estate um, accounted for just about eight or nine percent of that, just under 32 billion shillings. Uh, and building and construction sector about another 9 billion, which is around 11% collectively in the sector. NCBA was also active uh, in uh, both supporting customers that needed uh, restructuring, but also customers that continued trading and needed support to finance their operations in the real estate or even draw down in the mortgages for those that were not impacted uh, through their incomes or cash flows. With those few remarks, allow me to close. Um, and open up the discussion to our distinguished panel of uh, panelists. And I will close with a quote by Armstrong Williams, a global entrepreneur once said, real estate provides the highest returns, greatest values and the least risk. But obviously uh, with the help of some of the uh, knowledge that we have in the team, um, if you make the right decisions, and as I said earlier, uh, uh, you know, service your debt fully, manage your property well, um, uh, uh, real estate can be and will be, and for so many people remains the most significant uh, financial uh, decisions that, you may, that, that they make. I do hope that you'll find today's session insightful uh, and that it will, make, it will help you make that bold step uh, to invest in real estate. Um, our panelists will guide you, they'll show you their expertise, um, and at the end of it, do reach out to us uh, and our property finance team and, and the panelists that you'll have listened to so that we can all help you towards uh, that, that goal of owning your home or owning a property that is yielding you some return. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hand back over to Philip uh, to continue with today's program. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Tyrus, for, for those great insights and actually for amplifying the context of what we intend to discuss this morning. And equally for reaffirming that indeed NCBA aspires to be your financial partner that inspires growth. I would therefore like to welcome our panelists for today who will engage us in this discussion. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce our, our first speaker for today, Mr. Zor Zorava Singh, who is the director, iGenka Ventures Limited. A brief about Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh is currently the director a director at the Kenya Property Developers Association, APDA, where he chairs the Affordable Housing Task Force. Previously, he served as the general manager for agriculture at Equity Group Foundation, CEO of Community Lab with the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Mr. Singh holds a Bachelor of Commerce in Operations Management from the, Univ from the University of Alberta and a Master's of Business Administration in Real Estate and finance from Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. With that brief intro introduction, I would like to invite Mr. Singh to share his remarks. Wonderful, thank you so much um, for the introduction and again for, for being on this, uh, this great panel. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today and share a little bit of uh, insights into the the real estate sector, uh, especially as it relates to uh, retail investment. And I want to just pick up uh, a comment that Tyra has mentioned is that uh, real estate is a very safe investment. You know, it's, it's, it's true in that uh, it's very safe because it's backed by an asset. So at the end of the day, uh, even if uh, your, your rent is falling, you still have the underlying asset that you can sell. Unlike uh, other, uh, let's say more speculative um, uh, investments, stocks, you can see on the right side of this curve from a risk perspective are considered slightly higher risk. And uh, because uh, they're volatile, you might see swings of 10, 15, 20%, but you may not see that, that type of swing in your, re your real estate investment. You won't get as large deviation and sort of uh, manage to keep an average sort of uh, risk profile. And in real estate, there's, there's many ways to invest into property, uh, you know, you can see the event from the investment options that are listed on by the chart. Uh, one that we'll talk about a little bit today uh, as we look at retail investment is about rental units. That's, it's a big uh, 
a big trend picking up uh, units either yourself or perhaps you have a jama or a pool of people, the investors that you're working with. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Project finance, uh, you might uh, have been offered by a friend or a contact or someone to invest in their project, uh, put some equity into maybe a real estate development project. So maybe someone is building a home uh, out in Rungai and they want to build and sell, or someone is building a apartment building and they want to put an investment in. That's that's another opportunity for, uh, for, for investments, project finance. REITs, this is something we've been hearing a lot more about. Uh, and uh, right now it's currently for sophisticated investors, but basically this is a trend that you should watch and uh, because there's going to be a lot more uh, real estate that is going to be publicly listed as a REIT. And, uh, and uh, recently we, we saw the launch of the Acorn REIT, which is a student housing REIT, which uh, I believe will cover student housing and affordable housing. And uh, we'll, we'll certainly see more. Uh, bonds are, you know, th this is of course uh, lending like we see corporate bonds. And I think we don't see as many corporate bonds. We do have an Acorn bond in the market as well. And we know that uh, Centum recently raised a bond from mostly institutional investors. Uh, and, uh, but those are something we'll start to see more and more and perhaps access to investing in some of those bonds might open up. And lastly, private equity, you know, this is something that is kind of slightly more on the sophisticated side of real estate, but uh, where, where institutional funds like pensions pool their money together and invest in a pool of real estate projects development or rental projects. You can see this also, uh, you know, at a smaller scale when people get together at a chama and they, uh, they kind of pool some money and they say, okay, we want to invest in some projects. We'll put money into the first project that comes out then they reinvest in the second project. So these are all different types of ways you can be investing in the real estate sector. And we'll hone in a little bit on, on a couple of these later in the presentation. On the next slide, um, you know, we're talking about some of the trends, some of the, you know, some of the global trends are shown here, things like mass urbanization across the world. Even in, in, in Kenya, we're seeing a lot of urbanization uh, into the cities. The cities are growing very quickly. Globally, the demographics, we're seeing an aging population. Here, we still have a fairly young population. Um, and in terms of technology, we are certainly seeing a lot of innovation in the housing space, innovation in the real estate space whether it be for rentals, property management, whether it be for the construction uh, duration. So there's a, there's, there's a lot happening. Um, here locally, as we think about what are the, the pertinent trends, uh, you can see there COVID-19 has impacted several property types, including hospitality, retail, and office. And uh, you know certainly those sectors have been hit the hardest as people have not been taking vacations, as people have not been going out and shopping, they're doing a lot more online shopping. And also people are working from home. So we've seen a softening in the office market. We're now hopefully starting to see a movement towards, uh, or at least the direction towards a post COVID world with the vaccines now coming out. And there's already uh, in other financial centers in the world, there's capital starting to move because there's sort of this optimism that the vaccine will bring solutions uh, to the markets. Uh, we have to think here in Kenya, what is the impact of COVID? You know, we've seen, uh, we, we've seen a, a major increase in defaults. I think we've, uh, we're seeing an, a 13-year high in, in, uh, in property defaults. And we're also seeing kind of the revitalization of the auction markets, which, you know, is, is sort of a double-edged sword. It's you're very unfortunate. We're seeing a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of sort of defaults in the mortgage space. Uh, at the same time, that creates opportunity for some investors to get in and see if there's ways to, to come in onto to some rental property at a cheap price. So we'll see some changes in the market that will be taking place. Um, but we also will see uh, some major projects coming to the market. And this is sort of a major trend we're going to see in the real estate sector over the next five, 10 years. Uh, projects like the big KDF, 11,000 houses, a couple of weeks ago, a launch of a, another uh, student housing company called the Student Housing Factory. Large financings uh, from overseas with overseas capital or local capital. Uh, those, those institutional uh, real estate projects and programs will be delivering many uh, units to the market. Those will be important to watch, uh, but also you know, don't ignore 
the, uh, the, the developers that uh, are sort of doing projects on their own, sometimes you can get good pricing there. And we'll talk about that um, just in a moment. The last trend I wanted to, to mention was, uh, you know, we're definitely moving into an election period now. We're starting to see uh, the dialogue uh, increase. We're starting to uh, kind of get the feeling that, you know, we might, we're going to be heading into an election uh, cycle. So that, that certainly always has an effect on the economy. Uh, but uh, as people get back to work after COVID, you know, hopefully we'll start to see momentum in the market regain as well. Um, as we look at the next slide, th there's actually a lot of different ways to think about the real estate sector that we had talked about. Some, you know, we've been talking about rental uh, or re residential uh, in investments in the sector. Um, you know, there's also uh, the office sector, uh, the industrial, which I think looks like the, that was kind of captured on the same line there, but uh, industrial is another one. You know, in, in all of these cases, you can actually invest uh, on a per unit uh, basis. So residential, of course, everyone is very familiar with renting uh, residential apartments. And that's actually a really great way to build your portfolio slowly, one by one, uh, you know, pick up a unit, have it rented out, let it stabilize, you know, and then pick up the next one when you're comfortable. But it's also something you can do in the office space. You can pick up rental office units. There is a you know, some buildings that will sell units for rent that you can uh, also get for a good uh, good deal and a good yield. Uh, there is industrial real estate. There is sort of, you can buy a go down and rent that out. You know, it depends on which part of the sector you want to focus on. Um, as we look at focusing on, you know, sort of the one that we see in most markets get the most traction is the residential rental real estate. We find that uh, people start to accumulate a, a small portfolio and a growing portfolio of rental properties. And, uh, and, and that's a very good trend. As we go to the next slide, um, you know, there's, when you're looking at rental property or any property, uh, you, you, miss, you need to appreciate what is the life cycle of that, uh, of, of the, the real estate property. Well, at the beginning, you can see that there's a development. Uh, there's an investment that goes into building, the, designing the property, building it. And then once it's built, we get into something called the net operating income, or this is where you get your rental out of it. And then eventually there's a sale. So if you choose to uh, invest in, let's say, residential real estate, you want to buy a unit uh, for, for rent, uh, to rent out to someone, you might find that you get a good deal when you invest in them during the development investment phase. Now, there's been a, some talk about uh, off-plan sales and the challenges for developers to complete. This is something that we look at at the KPDA. And uh, so that's something you wanna be cognizant about, investing in reputable uh, developers, or you might find that banks uh, like NCBA Bank will be promoting some developers that have taken construction finance. Those projects are often higher quality because they're coming from an established financial institution. So you might uh, consider looking at those projects that are within the financial, established financial institutions. The other things to think about when you're thinking about um, rental housing, make sure you consider the location and how that location will grow over time. For example, we've been seeing a lot of momentum uh, through government programs around the redevelopment of uh, Eastlands, looking at Railway City, Think, looking at the development that's happening in Bangani. So if you see that the inside of the city is starting to densify, we're going to start to see a lot more residential units on the inside of the city. So, you know, oftentimes convenience of a uh, good location will, uh, will sort of retain a certain price. Also think about things like amenities, swimming pools or gyms and, uh, and the parking when you're, when you're buying uh, the unit. And lastly, when you're, you're thinking about investing in residential units, um, make sure you put enough money aside uh, for your mortgage payment, for your utilities, for service charge, for at least two, three months in case you find that your unit is vacant. Um, and uh, so make sure you do have a buffer because I think we find that, uh, you know, for people's primary residence, they have a lower default rate. But uh, for someone's rental property, we find that the defaults are higher. And a lot of that has to do with people's liquidity positions. So it's something that you need to keep in mind. It's a, you know, you may have enough money for the end to make the investment, but you also need some operating capital to uh, just in case you don't get a renter right away. So that's something uh, that, that we want to keep in mind. Is one of the next slide. Um, 
we, we are going to see a lot more uh, public market instruments, as we talked about earlier in the presentation. Uh, there is uh, the REITs market, uh, REITs product that are coming to the market. Um, over time, we're, we're seeing more uh, KMRC refinancings. So eventually, you know, there'll be more and more uh, public market products uh, to put uh, funds into, or you might find more and more of the fund managers pooling together investors for real estate projects. And this is something we've heard about where some of the fund managers that manage high net worth capital, they'll pool the money together. Uh, so there's a slightly larger pool and do bigger projects. So when you can do bigger projects, they're slightly more safe because they're more well-managed, well-organized. And if they're coming through a fund manager, they've likely taken, you know, made sure that the right team is in place, the right due diligence has been done. So you might find that direct investing, maybe you only get access to one property, but you might find that if you put your money with a fund manager or someone that's working or in public market, public equities, your investment will become more diversified and that, that will uh, be a little bit more stable. Um, next slide. So I, uh, I'm, you know, just in terms of uh, one of my roles in industry, I chair the affordable housing program on the private sector side. And we are seeing a lot uh, happening, a lot of mo uh, momentum happening in the housing sector. And as you, uh, as you look at uh, the housing sector in this example of how to look at the investment, you look at it from a supply side and a demand side, and, uh, and there's different opportunities and investment products on both sides. So on the supply side, direct investing into property are things like rental units or directly into the development itself. We call that developer's equity. Construction debt is a, a part of the finance. Some people do secondary loans or mezzanine finance to projects. On the indirecting side, we talked about REITs uh, or private equity, where you can give your money to a money manager or fund manager, and they can put it into projects. On the demand side, uh, most of it, this is institutional investing, housing finance or mortgage refinance uh, or institutional lending. Uh, so this, this one is not yet open uh, to public, but soon over time as the market uh, sort of evolves, we'll start to see more and more retail investment into the demand side and the mortgage side as well. So that's uh, that's kind of a you know uh, a bit of a, a structural overview of the sector with highlighting on a few opportunities, largely focused on investment into rental properties. And uh, I look forward to taking any questions or hearing any comments uh, during the Q and A. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Singh, for highlighting the different. Uh investment classes and equally for demystifying the various products that uh, our viewers can actually consider within the real estate sector as well as the opportunities that are available for investment in the housing sector on to our second panelist for today uh who is mr george washuri mr washuri is the ceo for optivent group a brief intro about and background about mr washuri mr washuri holds a master's of business administration from the University of Nairobi and a Bachelor of Commerce um, with generalization in marketing as an option and is equally a certified public accountant. George has won several awards across the globe, including the Africa Business Personality Award in 2018 by the Voice Achievers Award in Netherlands. And he was equally voted in 2017 as the best entrepreneur in East Africa. Under his stewardship, Optiben Group aims to create over 30,000 direct employees by the year 2030. With that brief introduction, I would like to invite Mr. Washuri to engage us in this discussion. Karibu, Mr. Washuri. Wow, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Philip. Uh, thank you, Philip, and thank you, uh, the panelists. And uh, we are very humbled that uh, we are here to encourage our Kenyan uh, uh, population to keep investing and to keep dreaming regardless of the challenges that are ongoing so allow me to thank uh, ncba for walking the journey to ensure that uh, many kenyan become homeowners i know that we have a very very solid partnership with ncba that have been seeing our customers uh, from kambu amani reach the place of peace getting mortgages other customers are getting mortgages from uh, the garden of joy in machakos and the Kitengela. So NCBA, you are walking the talk, and I'm happy that uh, this partnership is enabling our Kenyan people to acquire homes. You are aware that uh, 
80% of the uh, population within the city of Nairobi, they are renters and uh, they have a dream and their dream is to have their own home. So even those who are earning very little money, they have that particular dream. And I know that uh, for Optiven, we deal a lot with the diaspora and the question they always ask, which partner we go for? And of course, definitely, we always recommend NCBA for one, because of the long-term uh, mortgage, 25 years. And of course, the, the percentage, 105%. And this is very, very encouraging. I'd like to encourage the bank you know, to keep it, to keep it up there because there are many people uh, out there who are looking for this facility. And for us as developers on the ground, as the people who are rolling the sleeves on the ground, we are able to direct these uh, Kenyan people who have got a big dream of owning uh, a home uh, to this uh, partnership. And uh, I am happy to say that uh, for us, we specialize on land and recreation facilities. So we are land people. <laughs> and uh, for the past uh, couple of months, especially during COVID, we have seen a very interesting uh, movement, especially people living out of the country. We have seen an increase of people looking for green areas. Green areas means they are looking for a space to uh, put up their home and they can have a garden at the back. So uh, for us, we are away from the city of Nairobi and we have seen a lot of movement. I think every day we are people taking people to view. Uh, that means that regardless of the challenges, people still want a home, and not only a home, with the new economic challenges, with the new challenges of COVID. People have realized that your house is also your office. Like for us at Octavian, you are working from home. The office is a ghost. And this realization is going to see increment of people requiring their own spaces. And uh, it will continue because the new change is real, it's continuing. I don't think uh, we are going to go back to where we are. As, but as we do business, I know that uh, some of our customers are listening, is that uh, some ask, is real estate an investment asset? You know, is real estate, is property market, can it earn me income? And I'm happy that uh, the panelists here are expanding this discussion, that uh, you can invest in property, and this property can compete equally with other investments, like, uh, like uh, unit trust, you know, the stocks, it can equally be good. And I have uh, some reasons, uh, over 20 years I've done real estate, I have some re reasons that I recommend that uh, real estate is equal, equally good, maybe better investment asset for our viewers, for our listeners to invest in. Why? Because you tend to enjoy some benefits. Some of these benefits is that uh, you enjoy predictable cash flows, you know, the previous uh, panelists talked about uh, affordable houses that you can rent, you know, and then you are sure that next month, as long as it's a tenant, you are getting some cash flows. My advice to the people I, I speak to is diversification. If you're investing in the upper market, also get some units in the middle market and maybe some units in other diversified markets. That way, you are able to spread the risk that even if you are paying a mortgage to NCBA, you are getting some income from one or two other units and you can be able to keep uh, paying your mortgage. And I have seen many customers doing so. You find a customer has got a unit in Ruaka, a unit in Itengela, a unit in uh, Lavington, and you keep going. Number two, you are assured of good returns. You are assured of good returns, whether there is COVID or not. 80% <laughs> of Kenyan people <laughs> must go to sleep. They are sleeping <laughs> in your house. So they may delay to pay, but at the end of the day, Watakuripa, you know, we have a sister company that manages homes. And I saw some agreement say, when things comes back, we are going to pay the arrears. So you are sure that this money is coming. So if you consider real estate with other investment, the return on investment, it's friendly. Number three, of course, property market have got some advantages in terms of tax. I know that the government of Kenya introduced capital gain tax, but I'm also happy that uh, they put a cap whereby if you are trans transacting within three million, there's no capital gain tax. If a limb is more than a three million, the capital gain tax is friendly. 5% not so bad. You are able to make your money, and especially in uh, large transactions. Number four, I also advise people that uh, diversify, diversify. If you are going to invest in a real estate as an investment asset, Diversify, you know, as you diversify, maybe you have a property with Optivin. 
Maybe that property is for speculative purposes. Somewhere in Kitengela or somewhere in Konza or somewhere in Kiambu, you can also, if you're not building immediately, you can lease it. And you are seeing this happening in Kitengela. People who know Kitengela from Yukos all the way to KAG. Now the owners of those properties, they are now leasing. You see big images, properties for lease, and they are only leasing spaces. And by the way, Aneka, like in Kitengela to lease, they are asking for 200,000. You have not put any investment, you have not done roads, you have not done water, it's only the space. So the person, like a baby who comes and rent, you pay the owner <laughs> 200,000 and it is happening. So it's good to diversify. And then the finally, you can use the same title D, the same asset for leverage. You know, I have some customers that are doing a very good job. They buy this house from NCDA, they finish the mortgage, they buy another one, they combine the two titles, they, they use those titles as security, they buy another one, and then they keep building up because they say real estate or property purchase is addictive. Once you start with one property, I can assure you, you will keep going and going. And I want to encourage all our listeners and people who are watching us that you can be able to walk this journey. It is not an instant journey. It is step by step. I remember for me, in my first house, I bought uh, in 1999 after campus, you know, it was 1.9 million. People told me, hey, George, come out is far. Are you crazy? Don't you know Mutindua, the, jam, the traffic jam? Today, the story is different. The same house today is about 10 million. But I bought them because I could only afford far off the city. Today, I'm at a different place. And I want to encourage people who are listening to us. You can buy a property as far as you want. When things start coming back, you keep now coming to the places that you want. And that's the encouragement that I want to encourage. That's why NCBA, when they are financing outside Nairobi CBD, in the metropolis, you are employing these people for now and for the future. And definitely, the bonus point, appreciation. Property market, you are assured of appreciation. Whether there is politics, whether there is COVID, the property is just sitting there. I remember one time, 2007, I bought a property in Eldoret and people called me crazy. I said, president comes and goes, politics comes and goes. Five years later, we offload our property at a good margin. So if you are there, don't say I would invest because now 2022 is coming. No, go to NCBA, all of money and invest. And I'm sure the panelists here, they know right now you can negotiate because the buyers are complaining. You can now negotiate and say, hey, Mr. Sin, this property you are selling me at 10 million, can I pay you maybe 7.5? And I'm so sure eh, he will listen. Yeah, he will listen. It's a time to buy. As I conclude, because I deal with land, a question was asked, was asked, is land speculation a good model? Someone asked me, is it a good model? I would say, yes, it is a good model if it is done properly, as the director told us. If you do it in a correct manner, it is a good investment model. You can speculate, you can buy land, you hold it until developments start coming. And by the way, this is not a new thing to Kenya. If you look at the US, <laughs> Bill Gates himself is now buying land <laughs> to keep because in the future, the population is increasing. George Washington was a big land buyer. Don't go very far. Look at Nanyuki. Who owns Nanyuki? Nanyuki is owned by these guys who came to Kenya in 1903. They came to Kenya, bought land cheaply, and now Optiven is running to Nanyuki <laughs> to buy the same land a thousand times more than the previous point settlers. So, this is a business that has been there for over centuries. I know there are people who really not for land speculation, but I can tell you, Kenya today, 70% is community land, 70%. So you're talking about only 30%. And the people who are out there, and I know some of us here, they still buy land, they keep it waiting for 10 years to come, and up to then we come after 10 years, and we shall pass it, you get your money. So that's the origin, but finally, why is large speculation an attractive investment to many? Why is it an attractive investment to many? Of course, I, of course, I put a caveat that it is only attractive if you choose the right region, 
the right land and the right partner. But why is it so attractive? Number one, I think from my experience, is because of lower purchase cost. You can go to NCBA, borrow three million, and buy acres in Konza. <laughs> I know Konza is a hot kick because of the city. Until the government now put in regulations so that people don't do shanties. Number two, why is land speculation attractive investment? Number two, lower holding cost. You buy land in Amanga, you come back to Westlands and keep doing your trade. Mr. B buys land in Nyeri, come back to the city of Nairobi, do your business, and you wait for Keno Makoyo Duo College to finalize. And then you call Washiuri. Washiuri, I have 50 acres in Nyeri. How much are you selling? I am Mr. Kurudu and Acheka Cheka. <laughs> I am selling this amount of money. Why? Because you are aware of what is going to happen. So lower holding costs. That, that land, you're not paying tax. <laughs> There's no tax on freehold. Number three, this is advice to people who love speculation as an attractive investment. Please diversify. Don't buy everything in Kajiado. Buy something in Kajiado. Buy something in Makoyo. Buy something in Kiambu. Diversify your lands. That way, you are able to maximize your returns. Then finally, you can use this land as you wait for appreciation. You can rent it. You can lease it. You can farm. I have one of the customers who bought five acres from us. He has put very beautiful trees, and the trees are moving fast. The next five years, he will sell them. So you can be able to put something on that particular land. I have another customer in Kitengela. He is rearing goats and sheep, livestock. You know, as the goats are growing and people are buying, the land is also going up. That's why I say that uh, we still have an opportunity for NCBA even to finance these big parties uh, of these properties. I know it's sucking money from the economy, so I don't go that direction because the person you pay the property, they're also getting money to do their own business and the trade continues. And I think I'll put a comma there because I know that some people might have some questions and uh, we are here to encourage one another to go for property investment because even where we are, even where I am, I am inside a property and a property is like a basic need. It's like food. You need it. Whether it's COVID, you need a home. Whether it's after COVID, you need an office. Those who are doing commercial building, you need them. So property is a basic need. And I must congratulate the NCBA for encouraging many Kenyan people to realize this particular dream. And those people out there, I know there are people who have lost money, including myself. Every time you purchase this property, do your due diligence. Get a good lawyer. Conduct due diligence. Don't buy from fly by night. You know, do your research. We have a value there. Ask Billy, hey, my friend, can you value this piece of land for me? Do your research well, and then ensure that you get an expert advice. That's why for us at Optiven, we are here to work with you, to work with you for the last 20 years. We have enabled over 10,000 people to acquire their own homes. Let me put a comma there to give others a chance. Thank you, Mr. Ashuri, for, for those great insights. It is indeed very true that uh, real estate is very, very addictive, like your morning cup of tea. And, 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 and I, again, also, thank you for reaffirming that NCBA has a very, very strong partnership and for equally confirming that we finance a couple of mortgage uh, clients in various projects that uh, Optiven is currently um, selling. And, and to our listeners and our viewers this morning, we guarantee you convenience and excellence throughout the mortgage process. On to our next um, speaker for today, Mr. Kilundo Mbidi, who is the founder and lead consultant Investor Clinics. A brief biography, Mr. Kilundo holds a, bachelor, a bachelor's in land and economics and a postgraduate diploma, diploma in valuation an estate agency from the Institute of Surveyors of Kenya. He's a registered and licensed real estate agent. He is the publisher 
of investorclinics.com and convener of Property Talks. With those few, with that brief introduction, I would like to invite Mr. Mbibi to share his remarks on our today's topic. Thank you, Karibu. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Philip. Uh, I am very delighted to join my fellow panelists on this all important topic of real estate. And uh, those were wonderful presentations from Zarabar and George. And I'm going to add a little more into the conversation by focusing on um, real estate investment as an asset class. And uh, the first thing I'm going to say is that to our listeners and those who will be having an opportunity to watch uh, the videos uh, is that buy real estate, buy real estate and buy more real estate. So why is that important? And why has that been the trend over the last many years? You know, history and statistics have uh, provided us with confirmation that uh, real estate forms 90% of wealth creation over generations. And it also forms the bulk of generational wealth transfer. And I want to focus on the specific reasons why you need to consider real estate as one of the most brilliant asset classes in line with those who have been here before us. I loved what George talked about those uh, fellows who came to the country in 1900s and they have a serious foothold uh, on land and on buildings and they continue to do so. And uh, a question that I have been receiving over the last couple of months since the pandemic started is, is real estate still relevant as an investment vehicle uh, in light of what is happening? Now, the first thing that I want to mention is that real estate is a little bit special. When you look at the vehicles that are available to you, you mostly have about four vehicles that you can choose from. You have uh, the stocks, uh, the government securities as well. You also have um, uh, you know, gold, uh, what we call commodities. And you also have, uh, you know, bonds, but real estate seems to stand out. And one of the main reasons why it stands out, I want to actually expand what Washiri said, is that the wealthy are very smart people. And they have noticed that banks, <laughs> Tyrus uh, Institution, NCBA, they tend to, to work with people who are smart. They tend to work with people who understand how money works. So the wealthy have noticed that Tyrus has a huge portfolio of funds <laughs> sitting in his uh, coffers that he's willing to lend to a real estate investor. While many people who wish to invest in various vehicles will be working very hard trying to put coin after coin, coin after coin together so that they can do a sizable investment. And I loved what Washiri said about his first acquisition in, uh, I think, 20 years back. That was really wonderful. Uh, real estate has been seen to be accepted by the owners of money, the banks because it is a secure piece of collateral. I would imagine, and probably when George will be answering the questions, he will tell us whether he used a bit of this money to do the 1.9 million acquisition back in the day, or he borrowed a bit of that money from the bank. And uh, real estate offers that opportunity as opposed to, to stocks. You know, you cannot go to a bank to borrow money to buy stocks. Uh, similarly, you're not going to be able to use uh, a certificate of ownership of, you know, gold or uh, or any other kind of, of, of or a bond to, to acquire the same asset. So that's a very brilliant special attribute of real estate that our listeners could uh, could understand and start negotiating with the bank in order to benefit from that. The second special attribute 
Because yes, indeed, I want to tell you that real estate is very special. It's the question of income. Uh, in, the, in the days of pandemic, we are talking about businesses being disrupted, employment being disrupted. Uh, despite the fact that uh, we have lockdowns, uh, factories have closed down, uh, people are no longer going to offices, we still have a very high relevance of real estate as an accommodation. Uh, and that provides space, it provides room for the investor to be cushioned against lack of income from other sources. Uh, those of us who have, you know, businesses that are running, if you're a consultant and you're listening here, or you're running a business somewhere, and you have real estate that you have accumulated, you have, uh, I usually, when, when I'm uh, helping my um, investors to think about a retirement plan, I usually ask them to build a pyramid. A pyramid is said to be the strongest structure. And you can build a real estate pyramid in terms of income generating properties. You start, you start with your home, that's wonderful. Uh, Terrace will be at hand to provide you 105% financing. But the second thing you're going to do is you're going to start placing other properties, other homes like, like, like George was talking about, other homes in the periphery. You, you get the first you need the second, the fourth, the fifth, and now you have four, four corners of your pyramid that are providing you with cash flows. Now, the beauty with real estate as, as, as opposed to other investment vehicles is that this pyramid you've set up, these four corners that you've set up that are giving you income will be uh, instrumental in providing you further financing. I think today we are talking about financing of, uh, of properties. So this is, I would say this is really magical for real estate to provide you first with the base and secondly with the cash flows that you require to qualify for more financing and more financing until you build a complete pyramid that is very strong uh, it cannot be blown by the wind, uh, aka COVID-19. <laughs> so, so that gives you the second reason to trust with real estate, to continue investing in real estate and uh, have the benefits uh, always accruing to the investor. Now, the third very crucial point, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very uh, straightforward, it's a very uh, obvious attribute of real estate and, and George alluded to it, but I, I would like just to, to add more uh, ideas into that idea is, is the concept of growth of capital, the, the, the growth of value. Uh, over the last, since, since I left college 20 years back and, and have been consulting in valuation, and helping my clients acquire real estate. There has been a constant growth in values in Nairobi and most parts of the country. You'd be surprised. In 2003, 2004, uh, a two bedroom apartment in Kilelesha was going for 4 million shillings. And in 2004, that was a very high price. It was a crazy high price. Well. To many people, that may sound like, uh, you know, a deterrence or a disadvantage. But to an investor, to someone who is interested in building up cash flows and building up um, capital, they want to position themselves in an area that has steady growth, an area that has steady demand for housing. Today, the same two bedroom apartment in Kidalesha will easily go for 15 million. Uh, this consistent growth in real estate values is a special, is, is an attribute that, you know, convinces you or should convince you that real estate is a, is a brilliant vehicle that you want to maintain in your portfolio as you diversify in, with, with other portfolios for purposes of growing uh, capital and 
having the right amount of wealth that you can you can uh, transfer to the generations to come now having uh, identified a few uh, brilliant uh, special attributes that make real estate wonderful it's also important to look at some drawbacks some of the things that probably scare people from going into real estate full full blown and we have a few of them that you want to consider but the most important thing that i want to add you is you have mitigating factors on these drawbacks that i'm going to talk about i would encourage you to continue attending these uh webinars that are being organized by ncba to uh to educate yourself and understand how to deal with the challenges uh that uh, emanate from becoming a real estate investor and the first one has to do with liquidity uh, real estate is one of those assets that holds your money fair and square. It holds your money tight, it doesn't want to release it. So you want to structure your finances in a, in a way that uh, you understand the amount of capital that you have put in a piece of investment is not the kind of money that you require to take care of your lifestyle. It's not what you're going to be using to take your children to, to form one. It's not what you need you know, to quickly rush off and, and check your, your parents, your relatives. Real estate is not liquid. It takes time to be liquidated. Well, that sounds like a drawback, but when you come into real estate with the right knowledge, understanding that you need to structure this properly, then you will be cushioned. Uh, a brilliant way to do that is to borrow money, to use borrowed money to acquire real estate. That's so it means that, that, that you have not used all your savings to, to, to put uh, into that acquisition. The second drawback, what may derail most people to postpone uh, getting into real estate may be the question of being a passive source of income. Real estate is not exactly passive. You have to, Tyler started with a quote from a former president of the United States. And part of the quote was mentioning that real estate needs to be properly managed. So it requires your time. It requires your dedication. It requires your knowledge. Uh, I recommend, of course, you get property managers to manage properties for you. In my early time in my career, I did a lot of property management, but it is your job as an investor to manage your property manager. So you need to be touching base with the person who is looking after your uh, real estate to make sure that repairs are being done properly, um, tenants are being checked properly, and you know issues are not going to arise, then they stay for a very long period of time before they are resolved. And that leads to you know tenants walking out of uh, out of your investment. Now the third um, drawback, what you would say is a challenge that stops many people from looking at real estate, considering real estate as a, as a beautiful asset class that it is, is the capital outlay. It is it is common knowledge out there that you need millions and millions and millions to begin investing in real estate. This comes in as a challenge, as a drawback to many people. Uh, but like I said, these drawbacks are there. Yes, they are real, but you can mitigate those drawbacks by getting knowledge and getting uh, to understand uh, how the challenge can be solved with the existing solutions in the marketplace. One of the one of the great existing solution in the marketplace is the institution that has actually initiated this webinar, NCBA, which is a provider of capital. So what you need to understand is that you may not get into real estate, of course, with nothing, but you need to start from wherever you're standing at. Uh, if you have, uh, you know, a hundred thousand shillings, you need to figure out where you can get some bit of financing to acquire property uh, valued at probably half a million shillings. If you have a million shillings, you it's possible if you consult your financier to acquire property valued at three million, uh, four million, 
or even um, you know five million based on your ability ability to pay. Now to to close my remarks, I want to recommend uh, four steps, four very simple steps that uh, I would like our listeners to focus on when they are acquiring properties, so that it can be easy and uh, you know enjoyable. I I meet a lot of clients in my work as a consultant. And one of the things that they say is how banks are difficult, <laughs> okay? And of course, usually that tells me that they did not prepare themselves adequately to partake of what uh, solutions the bank are offering because, you know, um, uh, the, the bank will look at you and will, we rate you based on your preparedness and you know how good you are to the requirements. Now, four steps that are very important if you're joining this uh, industry as an investor. The first step is that you need to understand what asset class, what real estate class you need, you're getting into. Don't go out to the market when you're not clear that you're going to watch Yuri to get five acres that is serviced. Uh, don't go to the market without being clear that you're going to acquire a house. Don't go to the market without being clear that you're going to get an investment property. These three classes that I've described are different and they are looked at differently and the background investigations are done differently. So it is important to go out with clear knowledge of exactly what you're getting into. Now, having that in your fingertips, then the second step you should do is conduct market research. My experience has been that most, most uh, newbie, most investors who are going into real estate for the first time, and by the way, 90% of all transactions of real estate are done by people who are getting into real estate for the first time. So they constitute a huge proportion. And this is one of the stages that most beginners tend to skip. They don't do research on the specific market area that they want to acquire properties. Find out what is making properties or values of real estate in Kenya be so expensive in this particular market. Because if you are not prepared, you go very easily going to you know, uh, say that, you know, this particular market is overpriced and I'm not going to invest in that particular area. Of course, to your, to your detriment. So after you've done your market research and you have all the information uh, relevant to, the, to the, the market that you're going to acquire and probably you've identified a suitable uh, parcel of land, a suitable uh, apartment for cash flows, for rental income, you know, a suitable home, what you need to do is get into the third stage, which is investigations. And investigations uh, include uh, such as background investigation on the property, on the title deed. They also include investigations into the building if you're, you're buying an investment property. You know, I have experienced many is, instances where an investor goes into uh, an investment and they keep uh, undertaking uh, investigation into the structural soundness of the property. And after the contracts have been signed and everything is, gone, is going on properly, you realize the, that the building is, is, is written off. The building shouldn't be in the market in the first place. So th this takes a lot of your time. It leads to litigation. It holds your money. And it is a step that you should take seriously when you're go going into the process of acquiring property. So once you've done the third stage properly, you have your background on the titles and you also have uh, investigations into the performance as an investor. The performance of a property is very important to you. Then you move to the final stage, which is conveyance. And in this stage, I recommend, of course, you use experts. Uh, uh, use lawyers to transact uh, properties for you, irrespective of who you're buying the property from, okay? So when you follow those um, four simple steps and when you work 
with consultants. You need to have somebody who can give you, you know, a third, uh, a, a bird's eye view of, of the kind of uh, property you are acquiring. Then you can sit back and enjoy the acquisition once the title has been transferred into your name. If it's charged, the title is in your name and the bank's name, and it is pretty sitting for you, for, waiting for you to enjoy for the next 50, 60 years. That's the, the, the final beauty of real estate. You buy it once, you enjoy it for eternity. <laughs> and with those few remarks, I finish, I, I sign off by repeating what I said at the beginning, buy real estate, buy real estate, and buy more real estate. Thank you very much, Philip, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Bidi. Buy real estate, buy real estate. And again, also thank you for providing an outlook on what we expect going forward and equally for sensitizing the need to invest in real estate and equally just uh, summarizing the accompanying benefits. On to our final speaker for today, who is uh, Ms. Stella Mutai. Stella Mutai is the head of property finance at NCBA Bank. Stella has over 10 years experience um, leading and contributing to mortgage and equally she has vast experience in diaspora banking, product innovation, sales and marketing and, and, and regional and diaspora markets. Uh, she's a graduate, uh, um, an MBA graduate in strategic management um, and, and a Bachelor of Arts in communication from Daystar University. She equally holds a postgraduate Diploma in Project Management from the Kenya Institute of Management and Chartered Institute of Marketing um, with professional with professionalism um, more 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 geared towards a diploma in marketing from McKinney. She's equally a full member of Kenya Institute of Management and a member of Women in Real Estate, equally uh, summarized at, as Wire. Stella, having understood what it takes to own property, to own a property as enumerated by our earlier speakers for today, please would you be kind enough just to lend a perspective around property financing at NCBA and equally have a chance to just give a brief on, 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 on the 2021 outlook in real estate. Go for it, Stella. Thank you, Philip, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to be here uh, talking about property investment and uh, taking the bold step in real estate investment. One thing that you notice is that um, real estate investment is a very bold topic that cannot be covered within, within two hours, but I'm glad um, our team of experts have been able to unpack this topic. Um, uh, also, one thing also you note is that uh, real estate is a backbone of uh, Kenyan economy. We've noted it has been able to contribute around 8.3% to the economy. And uh, we've continued noting immense growth in the industry. As earlier, uh, Mr. Mbithi mentioned that um, a property in uh, Kilelesha in 2004 was going for 4 million. And, and, and I believe that's true because um, We've seen uh, immense growth in the property uh, in the property market, and this has been inspired by the by the infrastructure, also devolution, uh, decentralization of the government services to the counties, has led to the growth of the property market, and we'll continue seeing this as the government continues to open up more in infrastructure, and we'll find that more more areas will continue opening up in the in the counties. And we'll find also more people will be moving out even to the counties because now you will note that now there will be more, <coughs> excuse me, there will be more of a rural to urban migration. Initially, we used to say there was rural urban to migration and people are migrating to the major cities. But now we've noted people now are moving rural to urban migration. People are moving to the counties because opportunities have come up in the counties. And so since the opportunities have come up in the counties, you find that people will need shelter. So people will be moving out to the counties, they'll need houses, and that's why we're seeing now more developments coming up. So when, 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 for instance, you're buying a property, and I know this has been mentioned, you need to be able to be very careful of the location. Location matters very, very much because you don't want to buy a property and then tomorrow you find that the, there are no amenities, there's no means of transport, there are no roads. So we always say location, location, and ask yourself, will I be able to access the basic amenities? Um, then uh, I know 
in the past, there have been so many issues with the property, people confusing what do I need to do. One thing is that buying a property is relatively straightforward. However, there are pitfalls that people need to, uh, to avoid. And um, we as NCBA, as property finance, uh, we advise our customers to engage professionals before signing on that dotted line. And uh, some of the professionals one need to be able to understand, to be able to engage our people like surveyors, uh, like valuers, like lawyers, so as they're able to explain to you what is all this about property purchase. And um, with this background, you'll ask yourself, does NCBA support customers to acquire real estate and how do we go about it? One thing when we're talking about real estate, we're talking about we're talking about uh, the land as well as the improvements they are on. So the improvements they are on being the building. So we are able to support our customers to be able to take up the facilities. If you want to buy that piece of land, we'll be able to finance you. If you want to be able to, to buy, to construct, we'll be able to finance you to construct. And, and for this matter, when we're talking about construction, it's, it might be either you want to be able to find, to buy a residential your house, you want to buy a co to construct a commercial space or even to buy a commercial space as NCBA, well, we are able to finance our customers to be able to take up to take up any property that they want to take. And, and for that, for that, then also we have um, our buy and build solution. You might be thinking now that um, we need to be able to move, we are moving out of the state like towns and uh, maybe Optiven has this property. Can I be able to build immediately? Yes, at NCBA, we have that solution. We call it buy and build. You buy the piece of land and you simultaneously construct. And for these, we should tell our customers, we can be able to finance you up to 100% finance of, 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 the, of the piece of land as well as the construction cost to enable you maybe within a span of one year, you've already moved into your house, depending on what, what type of a house you're constructing. Then um, look, then also we have other facilities like equity release. If you already own a property, you can be able to get equity out of that property. Yeah, and uh, when you're getting that out of equity out of that property, maybe you want to buy another, another second house. We will be able to finance you to be able to acquire a second house, a third house, or even a fourth house. So as you can be able to have that pyramid and it forms a strong basis for, for you as, a, as an investor. Then looking at the process of, um, also we like taking our customers through the process of the property purchase. This is something that is not understood very well. And we try to explain out to our customers from point A to point B and all what it starts is for you identifying that piece of land that you want to buy. Once you understand these steps, you'll be able to be able to get in, into, the, into the investment or into property investment confidently. You need to be able to identify that piece of land. Maybe it could be within Nairobi and its environment. It could be outside Nairobi. We'll be able to finance you. So just get that piece of land. If you don't have even that piece of land, we have our property center. We have partnered with our with quite a number of uh, developers, vetted developers in the market to ensure that you are getting the correct product. And so once you get that property, once you get that, uh, you register that property, the next step is to conduct a due diligence of the property. Never sign the sale agreement before uh, doing a proper due diligence. What does it entail doing a due diligence of the property? One, it entails doing a search of the property. A search is done most, mostly in the land registries, there are different land registries in, in Kenya. Uh, and the main one being in Nairobi, it's good to be able to do a, a property search of this or a property search. It will show you who is the owner of the property. It will show you uh, maybe it has passed from how many people to how many people. It will show you is it encumbered, meaning does is there anyone who has a secondary right to this property? The second thing that you'll buy if you want, if you're buying a piece of land, also when you're doing a due diligence, it's good to be able to engage a surveyor. A surveyor will be able to show you the the beacons in the instant we don't want to come where maybe the instance whereby you are constructing and then you find that you say that you're constructing on someone else's piece of land it's necessary to be able to engage a surveyor and a surveyor will be able to show you the boundaries will be able to show you the size either it's a quarter either it's a half the, the survey will be able to show you all these things. So once you are comfortable with that then you can move now to the next stage of paying the deposit 
signing the sale agreement. And at this stage, even you don't have to wait even to, say, to sign the sale agreement, you can approach the bank for financing and the bank will be able to finance you. For instance, if you're buying a piece of land, you can be able to finance up to 70% of the purchase price. If you're buying a house, you can be able to finance up to 105% financing. And for a period of 25 years, if you're buying a house and if you're buying a piece of land, it's up to a period of five, five years. So then once you approach the bank, then the bank will be able to appraise you and give you an offer letter we do evaluation. We, as a bank, we also uh, like doing a further due diligence of the property. And the reason why we like doing a further due diligence of the property, we want to check this property, whether it has some other, whether maybe, for instance, the property is in the Dongo report, whether the property is on a riparian land, whether the property is near a railway line, whether the property is near, it's a public land. We need to understand all these factors because also we, we care about our customers because we don't want you as a customer to put in your hard-earned cash maybe to a property that is near a public, uh, either it's a public property. So it's good for us. We have a panel of valuers that we help us to be able to conduct or to do a further due diligence. Then once you are done with the evaluation, now we progress now to the conveyancing, whereby now the conveyancing is a legal process. It might be a difficult one, conveyancing, but generally it's, the, it's a legal process whereby now we are transferring the property will be transferred to you as the buyer of the property and charged to the bank. So conveyancing is done by a panel of lawyers. And as a bank, we have vetted a number, quite a number of lawyers who are able to do the conveyancing or the legal process and ensure it has been done properly. And then lastly, the property becomes, the property is, once the property is transferred to your name, it's transferred to you. And then we, as a bank, we're able to pay the vendor or the person selling this property. And then from there, we're able to exchange the documents. If it was a house, you're able to move into your house. If it's your, pro, it's your plot, now you can, if you're buying a piece of land, you can start fencing. Also, we advise our customers, once you buy a piece of land, don't just sit on it over there. Just make sure that you've marked your boundaries by either fencing off your property to avoid encroachment by other people, by your neighbors. It's, it's necessary to be able to ensure that you do all that. And once you've done that, you ask yourself, from all this process, you find that, yes, the bank is willing to to finance me, are there costs that come with the old property purchase? Yes, uh, we, we usually say that uh, the old process or the property purchase, it has costs ranging in between six to seven percent. And from all these costs, we tell our customers, if we are financing you for a property purchase or for a home, we can finance you up to one or five percent, but still there's some costs that you need to be able to raise. Some of the costs that usually we have is a stamp duty, Stamp duty is paid to the government, which is which ranges in between two percent to four percent. We need to be aware of that and maybe to be able to have saved to have your stamp duty. Then the other cost is to the, the payment of the professionals. We usually have several professionals who are involved, as I've mentioned. We have a professional like a surveyor, sometimes we, who is usually very underrated, but a very critical person in the whole property purchase pr uh, process. You also have a valuer, a valuer because they need to be able to ascertain what is the value of this property. Also, we have a lawyer. A lawyer is going to transfer the property to your name and ensure that there are no encumbrances to, to, to your property. And from all this, we usually say, as a bank that says, that says go for it, the numbers that matter to you matter to us. We are flexible in our financing terms and, and, and location. We are not fixated in locations that saying, we're just going to finance only in Nairobi and its environs. We are open, we've, we've opened up and we're able to finance outside even to other, other counties. It could be in Kisumu, it could be Mombasa, Nakuru. We'll be able to finance in which, whichever county that you are in, working to our branches, work calling our contact center. We'll be able to guide you, work with you, even share with you some of the property listings that we have. We have quite a number in our property portal, in our website. Also, we have our virtual tours that we're able to share with our customers. In, in, the, in the current pandemic, we're not able to have our bus tours, but we have our virtual we have our virtual tours our customers can be able to view from the comfort of their seats. Uh, we, we as, as I said, we are very flexible and at NCBA, we demystify the property purchase, uh, the ownership journey. That's why we are having these webinars to be able to educate our customers and to tell them that in um, real estate it is one of the safest asset class that they can be able to pick because one thing that um uh you we've noted is that a property the, the the property 
market has remained very resi resilient in this in this uh, pandemic. And uh, one thing that you notice is that a property ensures that your future is secured and it's a, it's a stepping stone to other investments. It gives you a property or a real estate, gives you stability, and it's a security for your future. And everyone needs a decent roof over their head since a home is a basic need. We, all, we always learn that a home is a basic need. And since a home is a basic need, why not? Why not? Why not uh, jump into it, being the safest asset class that assures you of capital appreciation, that assures you of good return in investment. And for those who are getting in for, for, for rental purposes, also it assures you of good rental yields. So walking into our branches, property center, uh, call in our contact center and we'll be able to demystify and guide you on the next frontiers that you can be able to take. Thank you very much. Uh, I wait for the questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stella, for actually highlighting the different products and, and equally for just breaking it down how, to how NCBA can actually walk our customers and, 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 uh, and our listeners who've joined us today uh, in investing in real estate and equally for just lending our perspective around the property financing um, market. Um, in 2021 as, 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 as we progress along. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we move into uh, the tail end of our webinar for today, which is the Q&A session. And I think uh, we've received some questions which uh, have been addressed to our panelists. I think the first one, uh, I was meant to actually push this to Stella and uh, Stella takes her breath. I'll, I'll throw this to Tyras. Um, how has NCBA supported mortgage customers during this COVID season? Right, thank you. No pressure for being the first one to, to speak, um, uh, to take the first question. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, we recognized um, as an industry um, that at the onset of COVID about a year ago when the announcements were made at the national level, um, that individuals' incomes and cash flows, uh, business cash flows would be impacted by, by the pandemic. And as an industry, uh, with the support of Central Bank, uh, we were able to create a framework for uh, restructuring of facilities. Um, and that was then executed at every bank uh, individually. Uh, in NCBA, we restructured uh, well over 70 billion shillings in loans across both corporate banking and retail banking, many of which were customers with mortgage or real estate um, uh, co construction um, um, or, or rental properties uh, that they had purchased and that you know they were being impacted uh, by the inability uh, to, to collect their rent. So at all the three levels, whether it was individuals buying uh, re, uh, their own homes for their own living that were impacted because salaries were reduced, or developers that we had financed uh, with the expectation that they would sell their facilities, which then was impacted because uh, generally uh, the supply of credit was restricted, um, generally, people's appetite to invest, they were conserving cash, particularly in the second half of the year. So the offtake of, of, of their units were slowed down uh, much slower than their projections had been. Or those other customers that were running real estate um, uh, businesses that collected rent and that's how they were able to repay loans. So for all those three customers, what we did is that we, we, we invited them to apply uh, and, and, and accommodated them with the restructures of either three months, six months, some as many as uh, 12 months, uh, where we suspended repayments for their interest uh, or, or principal or both. Uh, and we continue to support them um, uh, as, as they now begin to recover and resume their business. So NCBA supported uh, anyone that applied. And even today, um, despite the accommodation that central bank had opened for banks to be able to do restructuring without taking the cost of of that action we are still open to have discussions with anyone that can you know still feels impacted in in their own unique way uh, our relationship managers or property finance team will support um, uh, any customer and business banking rms as well uh, to, to to listen and and, and support them uh, and see how best we can manage uh, the situation whatever it is that they're facing Thank you. 
Thank you, Taras. My second question goes to Mr. Zoravasing. You made um, a highlight about real estate investment trust, and there's a question here about uh, was the Econ read public? Was it made public, open to the public to, to participate in uh, purchasing uh, the said investment vehicle? <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Proceed. Sorry, it's a bit, uh, a little got a little choppy there. But uh, the, the Acorn uh, REIT was open to institutional uh, investors, and uh, you know, at the moment, right now, we are seeing the REIT market, uh, you know, focus on the sophisticated investor or the institutional investor. But there is hopes that it's going to open up to the retail market as well. And, uh, and that should uh, hopefully democratize access to the REITs. And, and just to, you know, for everyone's uh, benefit and background, a REIT is basically a investment vehicle that holds real estate and uh, gives you the yield or the rental payment in a very tax efficient way. So it uh, has a reduction on, uh, on various uh, taxes like corporate taxes and VAT taxes. And so as uh, the REITs open up to the retail market, we will find that it's, a, it's, it's sort of an efficient, inflation-protected uh, investment product, but it's not yet open to the general public uh, retail market. And more related to that, Mr. Singh, um, away from re residential real estate space, which other areas are available within the real estate realm that offers good returns? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, uh, great question. I think if you know if we take into uh, consideration both COVID and general sort of macroeconomic development trends, um, you know, uh, of course, uh, residential housing, you know, we believe is uh, is one of the more protected or safer bets. But other asset classes or property types that we're finding uh, could be good investments. Uh, firstly, on uh, commercial, uh, we've seen a tremendous softening in the commercial market. Uh, and because we've seen a softening, there's uh, likely opportunities for uh, buying uh, commercial uh, spaces uh, on a, at a good price. Um, you know, so so kind of like buying low and then uh, getting a, making sure that you have a good uh, tenant, or if you're going to be the anchor tenant in that commercial space, making sure you have another subletter as well with you. But um, it's a nice, it's a good time to kind of see opportunities in the commercial market because you're getting uh, sort of distressed values. And, the, and, uh, and then the next one is on uh, industrial. Um, generally, from a macroeconomic perspective, we're seeing more and more industrial real estate being built and even maybe a shift of industrial to uh, kind of locations that are a little bit outside of the core of town. For example, uh, the Babadog, Babadogo, Rock area, or even all, uh, out to uh, Tatu City or Tbilisi. Um, you know, there, there, there is opportunities of if you buy sort of a large warehouse and even split it into smaller pieces. Uh, so basically within the warehouse itself, you can kind of have uh, more mini storage within it. And we often find when you take a larger piece of real estate and divide it into smaller pieces, you can get a higher rent per square foot uh, than you can if you rent out the entire uh, location or facility. So th those are those are two, and then I'd say the third one, which is a bit um, sort of less, uh, let's say less uh, kind of established, maybe, and, but it's also very viable, is on retail spaces. So whether it be kiosks, whether it be uh, the frontage of buildings that are now more and more uh, being allocated to retail, you know, those are also good uh, good investments if you can get if you can get a hold of some of those investments because. You know, those often buy, uh, provide you a very high rent per square foot. Often, you know, you can get 150, 200 shillings per square foot. Uh, it's a smaller space, but you see a lot of retail activity out of those uh, out of those spaces. So, you know, the, the 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 most common one like we had talked about is is the residential real estate. But if you dig deep, you can look at some of these other opportunities. And this is all from a retail perspective. If we're talking institutional real estate, there's other types of real estate that are interesting as well, like education real estate or healthcare real estate where you can uh, build and hold a hospital or school and rent it out on a long-term basis or lease it out on a long-term basis. But that's less retail, uh, you know, that's more institutional real estate. 
Um, and the last, the last comment I'll mention is the one thing to, to really be cognizant about in normal economic cycles is that you see sort of, you know, ups and downs in the economy. And, uh, you know, just making sure that uh, as we see, as you're making your investment, let's say if you're doing it within a project, a development project, that you're doing it at such a point where ideally you're catching the swing on the, the right side of the, the economic curve and it's on either in recovery, just be very careful about buying real estate at its peak price. And, you know, people talk a little bit about this concept of a bubble, but, you know, there, I think some of the real estate, real estate practitioners would say that we don't have enough trading units to even call this a bubble. We, you know, we haven't seen that sort of real rapid acceleration in prices. We've seen a slow gradual and even in a, in a softer economy like we've had in COVID, we've seen a minor reduction. So it's, you know, we're finding things at a pretty average uh, tilt right now. So it seems like we're, you know, uh, it's stable, but uh, now might be a good time to, to look at the market given the COVID recovery. All right. Thank you very much. I'm back to you, Stella. Can I be financed to acquire an allotment property and develop it later after I fully pay the loan? Thank you. Thank you, Philippe, and thank you for that question. Um, I can mention, yes, we finance properties, and one of the things that we look at when you're financing, uh, looking, financing uh, real estate, um, either a property to, to be freehold, a freehold title, or a leasehold. And we are talking about leasehold, um, and mostly leases are in between, could be either 30, 50, or 99 years. So we should require maybe a lease to be up to 45 years. So the main thing, yes, we will finance a property, but it either needs to be either a leasehold or a freehold property. Thank you, Stella. Still on you. Um, All right. Do we give the diaspora loans for someone with dual citizenship of USA and Kenya? Um, yes, we have a diaspora banking proposition where we finance our diaspora customers who want to invest uh, back home. We have what we call diaspora, uh, diaspora borrow. And uh, if, if somebody is in the diaspora, whichever part of the um, whichever part of the of the world, we'll be able to finance them. We'll just be able to look at um, uh, they, they need to be there legally, and uh, we'll look at the quite uh, several documents that we'll be able to be able to advise them based on their on their country or the juris jurisdiction where they are. All right, um, just still on you. I think it's more connected. I have a half done rental property and ownership documents are in place. Can you finance, can NCBA finance completion of the project with the completed units being and land being collateral? What type of loan is this? Uh, that's what we call we'll call a construction loan. Yes, if um, a property is halfway done, we can be able to finance. And one of the critical things that first of all that we need to be able to do is um, is the structure, the integrity of the structure to be able to check that yes, that structure has been um, standing for a while. We need to be able to ascertain that uh, it still can be able to stand or for how long it has been, maybe how long has it been fair? We need to be able to understand. And then um, the other thing is what will happen is that our team, the project managers will be able to visit the property to ascertain that uh, the integrity of that structure can be able to sustain the, the weight and then we can be able to progress. But yes, that will be at our construction loan facility. And the source of income for that is, um, and the West, we can be able to use the projected rental income, but during construction, we'll need to be able to service the interest. So we'll go back to the customer and ask them, maybe what is your current source of income? So as you can be able to know how your the interest will be serviced during the construction period. One thing that you'll note Philip is that we disperse our money in stages or in tranches. We don't give the customer the full money. So the customer will be paying the interest during construction. And since the customer is paying the interest during construction, we'll need to see their current source of income. Then upon completion, we'll be able to use the, the current source of income and the, pro and the rental income from the property that they were constructing. All right, thank you for that uh, response. Um, I would like to request Mr. Washuri to take this question. How do you evaluate potential growth areas when prospecting for land? Well, th thank you, thank you, Phil. And thank you for the question on how a Kenyan out there can be able to identify growth areas when uh, prospecting. 
Uh, one of the things that uh, one of the panelists said is uh, amenities. Are uh, there amenities? Can you get uh, a school near there? Can you get a hospital? Can you get entertainment center? You know, how is the public transport? You remember the people who are buying some of these properties, they are not driving. So, you know, how is the security? So those are things you need to uh, quickly check and then you can be able to make a decision. Number two, what are the nearby development? You know, what is happening in the nearby development? Right now, we uh, Kenyans are very good on research. And um, if you find that there's a big project coming up, uh, the area there, the, the places changes. And then uh, you can only get the uh, good places if you have information earlier before the information becomes public. And uh, I remember one time we were doing this big project in, uh, in Kiambu, Aman Ridge, and uh, we told people what we are going to do. And the places there or the neighborhood properties move from 9 million per acre to 16 million per acre. Today, I think it's about 40 million per acre. So what is happening within the development or where you are buying? Number three, how is the, how is the, you know, you can check at the upcoming cities, you know, uh, Zola talked about uh, Tattoo City, for example. You, we are talking about Konza, a Technopolis city. And uh, these uh, big government projects also informs our, uh, our people on where to put your money, where to borrow money from NCDA and put your money there. Because, you know, once this city becomes a reality, you'll be smiling all the way to NCDA. Because the property you buy at 495, <laughs> you'll be selling it at maybe four or four or five million. And then finally, government infrastructure. Kenya, we are very, we are very blessed that uh, our government is spending massive money in terms of infrastructure. You know, if you look at um, uh, Keno, Duo College, Keno Sagana, seven, uh, you know, seven billion investment from African Development Bank. So what is going to happen? All these, those five countries are going to open up. Look at uh, the express uh, uh, highway, you know. This is telling to people who are investing in Kitengela and Riba and across. And uh, you can be able to research and see what is happening in terms of government spending. That way, you know where to put your money. And uh, uh, that's how we do it. And if you need more information, we always advise you uh, uh, where to put your money. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ashiri. Uh, on to, I think, Mr. Kilundo, maybe you will take this one. What are the advantages and downsides of investing in real estate over other forms of investments like money markets, treasury bills, and bonds? Uh, thank you, Philip, for that question. Uh, yes, um, there are some drawbacks or disadvantages that real estate presents that are, you know, not as such compared to, to shares, bonds, and uh, the other forms of investment. The first one I had mentioned earlier during my, my presentation was that real estate is not liquid. Um, when you put in... Um, uh, your capital in a piece of real estate and you need to divest. You probably need to do something else or change uh, from that particular investment into a different kind of investment. It takes time to offload that kind of an investment. It, it, it does on regular basis. It does take even a year to sell a piece of real estate uh, in, in some um, classes of properties, uh, a sale can happen fast. I think uh, where George's um, does business land uh, because the volume of capital invested is, is medium, uh, it's possible to, to offload your property within a three month period, within a six month period. But now when it comes to large capital expenditure, you have 50 million on a piece of real estate, you know, 100 million and beyond uh, to offload that kind of property takes a bit of time. That's the first one. The second one is um, real estate is not passive. Uh, when you invest in a stock or a bond or say T-bills, you, you see pretty and <laughs> Uh, you know, on a certain date, the central bank will wire back your capital investment. Um, when it comes to real estate, you, you don't see pretty. You, you get involved in making sure that, you know, your tenants are getting um, the, the, the problems solved. You want to find out if there's a tenant who is having a challenge, especially right now when, when we are experiencing COVID, 
19, you want to have constant conversation with your tenants, you know, to ensure that uh, their problems are being handled and uh, yeah, the, the property will not, you know, go down into a situation where it is not working for you. And um, probably finally is, uh, I'll, I'll talk about complexity of transaction as, as one of the drawbacks that, you know, an investor would, would think about when they are considering real estate and bonds, T-bills and the, those kind of asset classes. If you are going to acquire a bond, it's straightforward. You go to the relevant uh, uh, institution that is doing the transactions and you purchase based on how much money you have. Similarly with uh, treasury bills, it's pretty straightforward. But when it comes to real estate, the transaction is, is, uh, is, is, two, is twofold. It's protracted and uh, complex to, to the person who has an, uh, the experience or the expertise to undertake a transaction. Lawyers have a, a standard uh, period within which uh, a standard transaction would take, which is 90 days. But it's not always that uh, a property can be completed uh, in 90 days, especially when there are challenges that arise in documentation, uh, there are challenges that arise in financing, in perfection of the financing documents. It can move beyond uh, 90 days to, to 120 to 180. And, and that puts off a few investors who are not you know, quite accustomed to being involved in a protracted process. It requires experts. You, uh, Stella talked about surveyors, very, very key. Uh, I had an experience where a client was just about to buy marshland because they did not know exactly the extent of the land. Uh, and, and the surveyor had to pinpoint that actually this land crosses this marshland. So we have to discuss, we have to go back to the drawing board and discuss, uh, are we buying the marshland? <laughs> or are we going to discuss what pricing uh, is going to be relevant given a piece of the of the land not being useful for the purpose. For example, if you're constructing, you, you, you're not going to do a development on marshland. Um, you have valuers, you have, uh, you have lawyers. That's quite a number of professionals that you need to engage with. And, you know, it, it could be a challenge to, to an investor who is not experienced in this uh, kind of acquisitions. Yeah, so those, those are things to consider. So those are many challenges that uh, may make you opt out of real estate, especially the one that has to do with liquidity. Uh, if you are considering having uh, a certain amount of money invested over a short term period, you know, that may make you opt uh, to follow a different route. Thank you, Philip. All right, thank you, right. Mr. Lindo. I think I'll throw this to Stella. Uh, I don't bank with you. Would it be possible to buy NCBA sponsored sp projects, more so the off-plan developments? And while at it, kindly just highlight the what what the banks look what what NCBA bank looks at to determine whether one qualifies for a mortgage. All right. Thank you, Philip, and thank you, uh, our viewer, our listener, for that question. Uh, yes, at NCBA, we, you don't have to be banking with us for us to be able to finance you. However, we will require you to start channeling your cash flows to NCBA once we advance you the facility. And uh, one of the two or critical things that we look at is the income. Uh, whether are you employed? Are you self-employed? Uh, if you're employed, we just need to be able to look at um, uh, the frequency of how you get your income. And you invest, if you're self-employed or in business banking, we'll be able to look at your cash flows. So we, we, we don't limit and say that you're just going to finance only people in employment because that has been the misconception in the past. Even though you're in business banking, we are in business, uh, we'll be able to finance you uh, through our business banking unit. In addition, there are critical things that we look at. Other than income, we look at the property. And this property could be either residential, could be commercial, could be industrial, or we will be able to finance you. And uh, for one of the other things that I'd, I've already mentioned, it should have a title, which is either freehold or, lease, or on leasehold. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. 
All right, still on you, Stella. I have a question here from Sophia Mapoja, who is watching us live on YouTube. Does NCBA give loans for prefabricated buildings? Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And uh, that's a good question. And I know that's a new technology that is coming up and that uh, we are constantly reviewing our policies to be able to see how we can be able to finance our customers. And um, when you're talking about free, uh, prefabricated, uh, it also depends on what type of materials our team of experts will be able to ascertain. And uh, yes, we, we can be able to say, to be able to ascertain to see whether we can be able to finance. As, as new technology is coming up, we are also constantly adopting the new technology that is coming up and for us to Sophia we can be able to visit the site to see what type of these prefabs are for us to be able to determine whether we're going to finance but as, as I've said as new technology is evolving we are also uh, evolving with the new trends and also looking at where how we can be able to support our customers all right thank you Stella I think this goes to Mr. Awashuri because he touched this in his presentation um, with the current market dynamics, is land speculation a, a sustainable model of investment? Mr. Washiri, you're muted. Uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, thank you, Philip. Thank you, Stella. I would say that uh, with the current uh, temporary situation, because no, no pandemic is permanent, uh, those people who have got an eye for the future, an eye to the horizon, this is the best time to do property speculation, is the best time to go out there, away from Nairobi Metropolis, and talk to people out there like Billy, what do you have? Because you have an edge in terms of um, negotiations. And this is the time people like NCBA, they are also telling us that bring the proposal, we shall finance 70%. So let me encourage people out there this is the time because people say successful people do things differently. When everybody is coiling, you do the opposite. You'll be successful. Thank you. All right. Um, I want to believe uh, we've addressed all the questions that came through to our Zoom chat box and equally on Facebook and YouTube. And if there's any other question that uh, you're feeling pressed to be addressed, at the tail end of this webinar, we'll provide an email address and phone numbers that you can reach us on. And obviously we'll be able to address them at the opportune time. I would also wish to advise that uh, uh, the, a full recording of this uh, webinar will be available on our Facebook page and YouTube after the webinar. With uh, that in mind, allow me to move uh, the closing remarks. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to our speakers and panelists for the valuable contributions uh, for, on this webinar for today, uh, them taking the bold step in real estate investment. Secondly, my deepest gratitude goes to all who attended the webinar and helped to make it such a successful event. To our sign language interpreter, Anna Musiomi, thank you for facilitating communication in a neutral manner and ensuring equal access to information and, and participation. And last but not least, uh, before ending my closing remarks, I would like to convey my appreciation to our group director, retail banking, Tyras Mwedega. I hope I've gotten it right this time around for engaging us in this discussion today. I've been your moderator for today, Philip Omondi, and I welcome you all to visit our property center located at Mamangina branch or any of our NCP branches countrywide. And I can assure you that we guarantee, we guarantee you convenience and excellence throughout the mortgage process. Thank you all for being here today and taking time to patiently listen to what we had in store. I wish you all a successful day. Goodbye. All right, bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, moderator. Well done. Bye.